Afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name's Stuart Clark. I'm the editor of TBI. Uh, please go and pick up a copy from outside. It, it's pretty good. Um, but more importantly, uh, we're joined by Dean Pozaniski, who is managing director of the EMEA region for A and E Networks. So that includes history, bio, crime and investigation, Lifetime, H2, and now the A and E channels. <coughs> excuse me. Internationally, uh, they've had a year of very impressive growth. There's more to come, and uh, we're going to talk talk through all of those things, programming and such like as well. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Dean, for joining us. Thank you, Stuart. So um, we'll kick off with some tape. We'd love for you to see some of our channels, content, and characters. So if we can roll the tape, thank you. can't get any better than this. <laughs> So, Dean, why, why don't we start off by looking at way, where A&E Networks is today? So, the company's recently turned 30. I mean, are you a documentary channel operator, a content creator, lifestyle channel operator? What, how, how do you see yourselves as a company at the moment? Well, first and foremost, we're an entertainment company. Um, I think content's very much at the heart of our business. Um, I hope everyone's inspired by the leaders they work for. I certainly am when I look at uh, the leaders of our business. Nancy Dubuque, who's now been CEO for near on a year, came from a producer background, was, was one of the uh, key people to really galvanize channels like A&E and History, has built an incredible uh, general management team around her, recently announcing Jana Bennett moving from London to hit up FYI. Um, in that team, I think we've got great creative individuals and executives, and I think that's at the very heart of the company. So we're an entertainment company, um, and I would also say we are very much a leading content company. And then internationally, it seems that last year, um, activity ramped up. Is, is that the, a fair way to be looking at things? There were a lot of channel launches. What was, what was behind that kind of that growth spurt, if you like, or is that just what we'll see continually from now on in? I think I, I would say that I think, you know, I began uh, four, nearly four years ago in the business, and I think over that period there's been a great deal of focus and investment in terms of really building uh, the quality of the teams that run our international business. And I think with Nancy coming on board a year ago, even more focus is now on international as a real growth driver at A&E Networks. Now, when we talk about us being a content company, you know, we're fortunate in the international space that every year... You know, coming through that pipeline is anywhere between 12 to 1,500 hours of incredible content across six brands. So naturally, we're in a great position to grow. Um, you know, there is plenty of room for growth for any networks. You know, in many of our territories, we may have two to four channels in place. You know, we are aiming for anywhere between three to six in every market. Uh, we now have six channel brands in Europe. I'm very proud of the fact that last year we completed a you know channel brand footprint with the launch of both, uh, well, three channel, three channel brands, A&E, Lifetime, and H2. And then historically, I've, I've been writing about the company for, for some time, and historically, when you went into a new market, it would be, it, you would find a strong local partner to go in. That was the way you, you gained access to markets. Now, in the, in the past year or so, we've seen some of those JVs change, and you've moved to a, whole, a you know, wholly owned position. What, what, what is the thinking behind that? I think we feel that um, we are mature and strong enough now that there are going to be markets where 
we want to own and operate, and in doing so, we can make direct investments and grow those markets. Um, Italy was a great example where, you know, we had one channel in play and a partnership with Fox. You know, we've taken ownership there. We've immediately launched Crime Investigation as the first factual crime channel in Italy. Very successful. I mean, I flipped to Europe, I'm sorry, to Asia, but when we took over the partnership that was previously with Astro, we had uh, two channels. We now have five. So we believe that, you know, there are markets where it makes sense to own and operate and we can grow quicker. Now, we launched Russia last year as a fully owned and operated uh, entity. But another example is France, where, you know, we moved into the market with, I think, you know, the preeminent media company, which is Canal Plus, uh, working with the Planet Group and have built and launched a and CI there. So there's no, I would say, fixed rule, but yeah, we are very focused where the opportunity lies to take ownership, we will. And, and, and obviously you, you're across EMEA, but in Asia, Astro were, were uh, are now not part of the, that JV, that's wholly owned, and in Europe, Fox are not part of that with, with you running that. What does it allow you to do that perhaps you couldn't do previously, that wholly owned position? I think it's about moving quicker, to be honest. I think, you know, JVs and their structure are running away with boards and partners, and it can take time sometimes to get the right actions in place, the right investments in place. I think when we fully own and operate, um, we are naturally closer to the business and we can move quicker, and, you know, we can 100% dictate the investment and the moves we want to make. You know, with that comes risk and return, uh, so we do that in the right way. But I think we've seen now in Italy um, already launching a second channel uh, we'll be very, very focused and probably move quicker in that market. Should we, should we expect where there are other historical joint ventures in place that over time you would look to move to ownership positions there or is it not necessarily that simple? Uh, we'd like to say, you know, where it makes sense, but I would certainly say there will be more, there will be more movement, absolutely, um, both in Europe and, you know, in Asia and markets where we have a range of different partners. Um, there are going to be markets where it makes sense for us, but also makes sense for the partner, uh, where those maybe those ventures have come to a place and they have more focused on their own business. All of our partners respect how strong A&E Networks is. You know, it's one of the leading cable groups in the US. We want to be a leading cable group in every local market, and you know, we feel in some markets the right way to achieve that is to take ownership and you know drive drive businesses ourselves. Uh, let, let me ask you about one specifically. You've got a very um, strong and long-standing JV with B Sky B in the UK, and I understand that actually um, operates channels further afield in the UK as well. Do you envisage taking um, a stronger ownership position there, or would you anticipate that remaining a joint venture? Hard to say right now. What I, what I would say about it is um, they're a brilliant partner. You know, to have someone like Sophie Turner-Lang sit on our board, be very involved in our partnership, um, there's a lot we learn from Sky, you know, as a platform um, involved in our business, but also as a content partner involved in the business. So, you know, the UK is a big business for us. It controls the UK and a range of other markets, Central Europe, Middle East and Africa. It's actually been incredibly high growth with the number of channels launching. So we're very happy with the growth there. I think Sky sync with us somewhat in that they're very interested in international growth. So we have no issues at all with Sky and sort of willingness to invest quickly to build new brands and businesses. Um, so... Honestly, no comment quite yet where that will go, yeah. And, and then we'll, we'll talk about local content and local commissioning, but in, in a, a, you have a very strong pipeline of content coming from the US. Does that still resonate as strongly with viewers internationally, or, or do you see that over time you need to move more and more to a local, uh, original local acquisition and commissioning position? Well, firstly, it does. I mean, we've been fortunate... Um, the quality and sort of universal appeal of the content um, and programming coming out of the US has worked around the globe. So, you know, if you look at history in Italy, Spain or India, um, shows like Porn Stars, Restoration, American Pickers are all right up there. Um, two times prime time average doing incredibly well. Um, we've got a range of new franchises coming through that work really well too, but we are absolutely ramping up um, both the caliber of our commissioners and programmers in these markets and the people coming into the business to develop local content and, you know, more hours. But what we're trying to do is build hours that can hold their, hold their weight against the US content and, you know, importantly try and find projects that can translate from a local base across the globe. Um, and, you know, the last couple of years we've seen great success doing that. And then uh, lots of the US content, it, not lots, but there are, there are some great examples of some of those shows that are about big characters doing perhaps doing unusual jobs in unusual parts of, of the States in particular. And there's been... Um, some comment recently that there might be uh, some viewer fatigue around that type of show. 
Do you think that's the case, or do you think we'll just see those type of shows evolving in, in different ways? I think we keep evolving. Um, you know, a while back, Artifactual and shows like Porn Stars and Restoration were very, very strong, and they continue to be, but we've evolved into new formats and franchises of late. Um, you know, shows like Swamp People, Duck Dynasty, Mountain Men, you know, just showing a different, a different lifestyle, a different way of life, and incredibly interesting characters that I think many people can connect with in, in different ways. Um, so I don't see that. I don't see that changing. I think we're very fortunate, as I said, in the U.S. We've got a team that, if anything, is kind of creating the new formats, creating the new uh, genres and trends. So as long as we're leading and bringing new content, which we will, you know, we're continuing to see success in these formats. And, and as the international channels mature, what, what as of today, what, what is the the position re local content? Presumably, we're seeing more and more uh, locally originated programming. We are. I mean, something that we're focused on now um, is bringing formats that have worked in the U.S. into local markets. Um, that's a key part of our, you know, next generation of local content. Um, Porn Stars UK. You know, we worked with our partners, Left Field Pictures. I didn't know it, but there are there are there are thousands of porn shops in the U.K. We narrowed those down to 200. We found a great family with great chemistry, great British humour um, in Manchester. You know, that show, we had buy-in from all of our international networks and, you know, the show has been incredible success in the UK but across the globe, whether it be in Italy or Australia, the show has performed incredibly well. So look for more of that. Look for, you know, a format like Porn Stars becoming, um, you know, a flagship in, in other markets. You know, uh, Pickers, Aussie Pickers in Australia and the Italian format, Italian Pickers have been incredibly successful too. So that's happening. Um, on top of that, there are just opportunities to build very big events locally. So an example was um, Miracle Rising South Africa where, you know, we really told the story of South Africa's transformation to a, you know, fair and free democracy um, in a way that I think was very special and on par with, you know, the type of production values you'll see in the US with our, with our partners. Um, very proud of that show, you know, a range of individuals involved that, you know, the key players in that negotiation and the elections and then others like Oprah Winfrey, Bono, um, Desmond Tutu, Richard Branson, you know, all involved in the production. So it had real global appeal. So another show that, you know, began in South Africa and actually every single history channel in the world carried that show. And, and you mentioned um, formats. It, will we see more local versions of US shows going forward and then... I wonder, are there some US shows you look at and think, yeah, that, that would really work on one, two, or more of our international networks? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I think um, many of our local programmers and producers aspire to that. You know, they have great local ideas, um, but I think they feel there's potential to bring formats, um, introduce them to a market and add a different appeal and, you know, really build on the strength that we already have. And typically, would, would a, a, a format go into a territory where the... US version has already been successful. How do you how do you kind of coordinate having a local version and uh, the original US version? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I think there has to be a base there to work from. So, Porn Stars was a great example, or Pickers in Italy. You know, the incredible history in that country to travel around and discover. Um, you know, would we find a swamp people in too many international markets? Maybe not, but I think Artifactual and shows now like Storage Wars, which are very entrepreneurial in nature, I think they're great examples of shipping wars where we're now, you know, beginning to look at that format internationally. You know, they can absolutely adapt. Um, and it's just brilliant to bring them to life with local characters, local faces. And, and how, in terms of international programming, do, do you guys have one international programming hub from which kind of everything emanates? How is it structured? Well, we have an international programming team, and we were very fortunate um, not so long ago, Sally Habershaw joined the team and heads up with Christian Murphy, the international programming group. Um, you know, the local programmers spend a great deal of time together through Sally and Christian sharing, you know, their experiments, experiences, risks and successes. Um, so that, that absolutely works. And then, you know, where we can, and we're doing more of this, we look for the opportunity to build productions together as, a, as an international group. So... You know, World Wars, which is a really innovative way to address the anniversary of World War One, is a great example as a co-production that's been built through all our international channels um, with the U.S. channels too. Well, World Wars is, is a really interesting example, as you say, and that's the, all of the international history channels coming together to work on, on one project, but it was originated in the U.S. Can you tell us more about that show? 
Yeah, I mean, we, I, I was actually there in the room and we get together on a regular basis with the US uh, executives and commissioners, with all of our international executives, and we look at ideas together. And that was something that, you know, very important to us in Europe and other international markets is this anniversary, um, and obviously important in the US too. So, you know, in a room together with production partners, we started to build the concept. Now, we're fortunate we're addressing, well, we're, we're executing on it in the same style that we did with the men that built America. So, you know, award-winning CGI uh, reenactment and then, you know, great range of, uh, you know, world leaders involved, so the likes of Colin Powell or John Major, ex-British Prime Minister involved. But it was something that was a, you know, true collaboration um, with that team. And, you know, we can talk more about the show, but the way that it actually carries through the characters, the leaders of World War II and their experiences that shaped them into leaders in World War I, I think is going to be something very different from the other range of World War I shows we'll see out on screen. And it requires buy-in from all of the international histories. It does, it does. I mean, to fund it at the level that we want to fund it at, to make it, as I say, that type of quality Men That Build America, you know, event, um, it had to be. And everyone was a taker. I mean, there was a great, great enthusiasm around this project. And, you know, this is something that I think you'll see more of from our international channel group, which is finding big stories, big events, big characters that we can work together as an international group. How many, that is you know, an enormous undertaking in terms of coordination, presumably huge budget as well. How many of those projects, those kind of standout event projects can you do in a given year? I would say at this point in time, we're probably talking from the international group, one, maybe two a year. Um, you know, this is really about quality than more than quantity at the moment. We may evolve further, but uh, I think we all feel like this show will be an absolute standout for you know ourselves and our platform partners and viewers. So if it's one a year, the quality of what we're doing with World Wars, I think we're, we were very happy with that. And, and where, where are we at in, in terms of the production schedule and such like? Is that ready to go now? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think we're, we're sharing a um, great deal of uh, the production with the partners. We've had some buy-in, we've had some, some tweaks across um, different aspects, but we're, we're nearly there, we're nearly done. Do you have, will there be one, when you, when you kind of pull all the pieces together like this, do you end up with one version that goes out in each territory or, or do you kind of seek to tweak and localise in some way? Well, we localise, but it's localization that will run across the globe. So we're not going to create um, a show that will be adapted to one market and another. We're, we're looking to build, um, you know, the, the story and the program that will work across the globe. But obviously you know, the types of um, leaders we're talking about, you know, Hitler, Mussolini, De Gaulle, Churchill. I mean, there's great involvement from all of our European groups, Tojo, Japan, um, MacArthur, America. So I think everyone feels, the majority of our channels feel a real local presence and influence there. And when, when you have something like that, how do you intend to launch it almost simultaneously across that big channel footprint? Or is it staggered? Because I guess... Potentially, there's a really nice marketing piece that you could go out at the same time in many different countries. Yeah, absolutely. I think with big, you know, and, and we're doing this continually. So with Mankind, um, 18 months back, with Big History more recently, and with World Wars, there's an opportunity to do that. Now, when, sometimes we're not synced exact day and date, but we're looking at least to be in the same week and to be able to talk about it as, you know, consistent, a big global event on history. And for, for producers in the room that, that want to work with you, that have got ideas and such like... Do, do they go to one of the programming heads you spoke to? I mean, how, what is the best way to work with you, assuming that they've watched the channel and have a sense of what it is, channels, what it is you're after? You did approach, you know, your local contact or international? How, what's the process? I think going local is best. I mean, we've got commissioners in, in all markets. Um, they're very active. They'll be at markets. They'll be at festivals. They'll be on panels. Um, by all means, just reach out directly to them. I mean, um, finding their details I don't think would be, would be difficult. They're quite prominent. You know, we are moving now more and more in markets to actually have, you know, regular briefings with our production partners and the wider production community to talk to them about, you know, what we're looking for, whether it be talent, sort of brand filters, rights, um, ideas, and have them pitch back. So I think we're always open to, you know, new ideas. Again, we're fortunate as per the U.S., We've got great creative minds inside our local businesses and we may sometimes turn to a range of producers and brief and ask them to come back, um, but we're always very open. So I think what you said at the start about actually watching the channel is critical because you can see 
obviously what's on the channel and what's what's coming through those universal American shows, but also look at the local production, uh, look at where we're moving. I mean, if you look at the UK, we've moved a long way from a few years ago with a number of one-off specials. You won't see that on history in the UK or actually on CIA, crime and investigation or any. We're, we're looking for, you know, short-running six to ten you know, hours um, series with characters, a show like Mud Men uh, with a celebrity like Johnny Vaughan, which started on the River Thames with the artifactual piece. You know, uh, Porn Stars UK is another example of a show that, you know, we all hope will be back for a second series. So we're looking more and more so at series that can work. And, you know, uh, Crime and Investigation is the same. You know, Gangs that Built Britain, um, Gangs of Britain, sorry, uh, recently on CI uh, with Gary and Martin Kemp was a Big, big success for us. Uh, I think that's a great example of incorporating, you know, great local talent into really interesting storytelling. And as competition for, for the best content increases, what, what we have seen is some of your competitors and other companies um, have actually started to acquire stakes in production businesses or buy them outright. Is, is that something that you could envisage happening with you guys? I, I wouldn't say no to it. You know, where the right opportunity lies, we will. Um, you know, where we are at the moment is an incredibly strong place in terms of our relationships with, I mean, we very much talk about our partners internally. Um, you know, the production partners, the affiliate partners, but the production partners are critical. And I think at the moment, having that flexibility to work across a range of production partners is is great for us. Um, you know, we work with big partners. I mean, we're working with ITV studios in the UK, um, obviously Gurney, with Duck Dynasty as well. Um, we're working at the moment on some development with Fremantle in Italy. Um, but we also work with, you know, smaller, more boutique partners. Not too many left, but we're in where they are. You know, we're open to it as well. Um, so maybe in the future we'll look um, where the opportunity is right. But right now it's not something we're set on in terms of having to own to keep the quality of our productions does, running. Dean, does that, that consolidation in the production sector... Um, does, does that affect your access to content? Does it make it more challenging? Does it have an impact on the business? Well, I think we need to keep growing with it. So if you look in the US, the creation of a &E Studios, headed by Bob DiBattetto, I mean, there'll be a lot of noise about a &E Studios and our investment in Scripted and wanting to move to ownership of Scripted. But another critical part of a &E Studios is ensuring that we are, you know, forefront of producers' mind. We're building those relationships as strong as possible. I mean, we've always been there but we don't take it for granted. You know, we've got to keep working harder. And, you know, we've got Bob, one of the best creative executives in the US, at the front building a team to do that. Locally, um, you know, I've not seen an example of anyone ruling out wanting to work with us based on, based on ownership structure. Um, so we don't see it right now, but, you know, we'll keep evolving and keep watching it, definitely. And then you, in, in terms of working with producers, as you say, you're working with some of the, kind of, you know, the biggest, best, and also some of the more boutique um, operations out there. What's your position in terms of rights? In, and by that I mean, if you work with someone, would you expect to be taking all of the rights? Because of course you've got a, a business exploiting those internationally as well. Yeah. Well, look, our model in the US, and when I talk about that large number of hours coming through, has been about ownership. It's about being there at the inception and the creation of the programming, investing at that early stage, and having you know, global ownership and rights ownership, and that's a big part of our success internationally. You know, where and when we can locally, we will, and that's front of the agenda when we go into a production and a conversation. Uh, we know that we need to invest to do that. We know that there's a international distribution market. We're fortunate. I think we have a fantastic, you know, we haven't spoken much about it, but behind our channels business, we have an incredibly strong distribution business, obviously with the breadth of our catalogue. So, you know, we feel we're in a really strong place to represent the investment really well from a distribution point of view. So it's always, always a really important part of the investment and the production for us. Now, not in every single instance will we have international production rights from a local commission, but we're always looking to do it and we think we can serve it really well. And then the, the international distribution piece that doesn't always get talked about, but is an yeah. important part of the business. Where, where does the growth come from? And, and presumably that's selling second window rights in yes. many cases. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's as of now, you know, our channels, we are growing within the pay TV environment and platforms, and we have a great deal of room to do so as we build to four or six channels. You know, right now we're not, we're not front and center in the free-to-air space. That may change in the future. We're very open to it. So, you know, we have a fairly complementary model where we're premiering content on our channels and pay, then windowing to free-to-air. Now, obviously, you know, a number of markets with DTT, digital terrestrial, opening up in, 
a whole range of new channels um, coming to markets, and many of them focused on to factual entertainment. Um, we've been a fantastic partner, and we've grown um, you know the size of our distribution business and markets like Spain, Germany, Italy, um, UK more recently, ITV4, you know, big success with shows like Storage Wars, Duck Dynasty and X-Men. So, you know, we're just fortunate, you know, they see the success of this programming on our channels. Um, they believe and they're right that it can really work in that free-to-air space. You know, aside from that, you know, there is some content that's going first window uh, where a channel like Lifetime is not yet in play in a market like France. You know, we've got a big commitment with a partner like TF1 for Lifetime movies, so that too is an important part of our distribution business. And then we, we again, looking at perhaps what some of your competitors have done, in, in pay TV markets that are mature or reaching maturity, we've seen people making moves into free-to-air. Do you see that as part of the, the play, if you like, at A&E, or are you at a different stage where you're still rolling out channels and there's still plenty of headroom for growth within the pay TV world for you? I think there's plenty of headroom for growth for us right now in pay TV. I think we've built great partnerships. Um, and as we prove ourselves, you know, when we've launched channels of late like a &E in France or CI in Italy, really, really successful. And the partners then look to us for more and to build from, you know, two channels in Italy now. We've got an ambition to be four or five channels there. Now, that's an immediate opportunity and partnership we're growing. And saying that, you know, it's interesting for us when we actually are distributing our content in the free-to-air market and we can see the audience performance of a porn stars, you know, with, you know, the amount of hours we have or a storage wars in the free-to-air space, of course, uh, we know the content works and there is going to be, I'm sure, opportunities for us to look more seriously. The great thing is when we go there, we'll be very well informed in terms of the exposure we've already had and the experience we've had through our free-to-air sales. And what, what do you see as the, uh, the ideal number of channels in, in the bouquet for you, you guys? Five or six, that seems to be where you, you're yeah, headed. Yeah, I mean, we tend to talk about between three to six. I mean, for me, I would say five. I think four to five. Um, you know, if you think of history in H2, very complimentary channels. You know, Lifetime is the female entertainment network. CI, um, factual crime, female a little bit older. Um, FYI, which will be a channel we'll talk about in the future and look to build. And, and then A&E um, as a factual entertainment channel that actually can become broad in the factual entertainment. I mean... In Latin America, a and &E is a you know, channel that carries scripted as well. So I think you know, at the moment we have six channel brands in Europe. I think between four to six is where I'd aim for. Maybe five is the sort of sweet spot. And then A&E launched in France yes. last year. Uh, what can we expect in terms of rollouts of that, that channel and that brand this year and beyond? Do we uh, you, I mean, without naming when and where, you will see A&E launch in more major European markets this year. Um, I'm really excited about it. I think it's a, you know, it's a brand that we can build through the programming, through the personalities, and we are very fortunate as we you know, launch a channel like a and &E in France with Duck Dynasty and Storage Wars and these types. I mean, it was fantastic being in Paris and seeing all of the telephone boxes and billboards with Duck Dynasty with the characters there. You know, it's, it's those characters and those shows that really define what the channel is. So you'll see more of a and &E, uh, more launches of the channel um, in Europe this year. And what was Bio is becoming FYI, and is that, is that true internationally as well? No, it's not necessarily internationally. I mean, um, in the US, uh, I mean, look, whenever we've built and launched a new channel, we've had to be incredibly confident that we can do it and we can really, you know, achieve the success we've seen on our other networks in the US, and we really are about FYI. We think it's, it's something different in the lifestyle space. It's younger, it's more savvy, it's very social, it's about improvised living, it's, it's about... Um, experimentation, um, and it's very broad. So, you know, the channel will talk to home, health, um, travel, you know, a whole range of uh, food, a whole range of different topics, um, but done in a very innovative, creative way. So, you know, in the US, uh, we're very positive. In Europe, uh, we won't necessarily go there. I mean, you will know that in the UK, bio became lifetime. So when you look in Europe and we're looking to build brands like Lifetime, A&E, um, and H2, um, along with FYI, there's actually a range of opportunities there. I mean, we look at the market and look at where do we think we're going to be strongest with a new channel or the evolving channel. I mean, do, do, you, do you envisage there being an, an international FYI this year in, in any of the territories you, you oversee? For me... Um, 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't stake right now that we're going to launch FYI this year. I mean, it's a little bit like when we launched Lifetime, we took ownership of Lifetime in the US. I mean, it was a little over two years later, we launched in the UK. And I think we wanted to take the time to build up the content, to really understand the channel, to look at what had worked in the US and what hadn't. And we launched in the UK with a great uh, range of content behind us and also all those experiences and learnings from the US. So, you know, I would approach FYI in a similar way, which is, you know, it's launching in July in the US. Obviously, there's going to be a massive investment in content and new hours, which we will own and build up. And, you know, 2015 will be an interesting year for FYI, I would say. And in terms of the content coming out of the US, we're starting to see some really interesting, or we have seen some really interesting scripted projects with the Bible, Vikings, and I know there's more to come. Internationally, one, internationally, how do they play? Do they work well? Do you have them on your channels? And two, will we ever get to a stage where there might be original scripted content coming out of the international part of the business? So firstly, yeah, I mean, the US um, is incredibly successful. I think, again, talks to the quality of the leadership and the team there, you know, um, A&E with Bates Motel, um, history, you know, with the Vikings and the Bible, Hatfields and McCoy, obviously, um, Lifetime to a number of great scripted programs, um, products coming through. We've created an A&E studio so that we can look to invest and take international ownership in the future of the right scripted products, the right scripted programs. Um, those shows I just mentioned, we don't have international ownership. So like any other channel, we're talking to distributors, trying to find the right deal to get it onto our networks. We'd love to. We'd love to replicate you know, what history is doing in the US. So yeah, Vikings um, will run, and it did run in Poland, um, very successful, will run in the UK. We're looking at it for other markets. Um, you know, a show like Houdini, which is coming down the pipeline, we're looking at. Sons of Liberty is actually a miniseries that we do own internationally, so we'll be doing all we can to ensure that is on the channel. Um, you know, when it comes to originating scripted from our channels, um, my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we're quite there yet in terms of actually scripted origination. I think the first step for us is really, you know, looking where we want to invest to take that ownership from the US, um, from A&E Studios and making that work. But, you know, down the track possibly. So as, as of today, with something like Vikings, effectively you have to acquire it from MGM, don't you? Yes. With, with A&E Studios, is part of the thinking that you have ownership of the content more and more, and therefore there's a, a more direct pipeline to the international channels. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, anyone that deals in this field knows, you know, they are big numbers. That's a big investment. So the economics needs to be right. Um, what our local channels are investing to run the scripted programming needs to be at a market level. But it's fantastic when you own it. It's fantastic when you can work creatively to find the deal and to make it happen with your channels um, versus sort of throwing throwing numbers at a distributor and hoping you're going to get it, we'll spend a lot of time up front with our partners and, and our channels and hopefully, you know, get the buy-in early so we know and the budget is there to invest. Good stuff. Um, do we have any questions from the audience for Dean? We're, we're covering quite a lot of ground here, but if, uh, if there is, then please put up your hand. Gentlemen, there. So I think there's a, sorry, so I think there's a microphone headed your way. I'm just wondering if you got, um, is there a trailer we can see of World Wars? Because it looks great. Yeah. Sorry? It's being screened. It's going to be screened at midnight? Great, great. So, the trailer is? Yeah, okay, so sorry. I've just been informed the trailer will be in the midnight screening. Sorry, we don't have it here now, we, um, but you can see it, absolutely. And, and when, when does it launch again? Theme? Sorry, is that well, when it's going to be available be from, from June, so June, July. Um, so we'll, we'll have it up on air. You know, it may depend on different markets when we want to screen, when we want to put it up, but um, from June, July this year. Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions? There's one at the front. Hi, uh, Elizabeth Guider from The Hollywood Reporter. Um, I think. You know, A&E used to be called arts and entertainment, and it's now more, I guess, entertainment than arts. I'm just wondering if internationally there is a, you know, is this is a psychological question, or, or do you feel that, is there any disconnect between the kind of high-end things you are doing with World War One and with, storage wars. I mean, what, what, what do you feel about the, 
disconnect between the low end and the high end, and how do you maneuver that? I mean, we could spend three hours here, yeah, but sure. I, no, I no, just but sort I, of want to get a sense of where it is, what's in the thinking internationally about this broad remit. I think internationally we see, I mean, we don't define A&E when we launch in France. We don't go out and explain technically A&E, what the letters represent. We build that through the characters and it's pretty clear A&E is a very fresh new entertainment channel, inter factual entertainment with characters and experiences and places you'll see that you won't see anywhere else. And we're fortunate with our partners, Planet and Canal Plus, we also have great local commissioning. So I think that's what A&E is. Um, history, you know, is factual entertainment. And within that entertainment, there's always going to be an element of information or discovery. That's really important to us. So, you know, a show like Porn Stars or Restoration, really entertaining characters, family-owned businesses, negotiations, but you'll learn something from the experience. I think H2 now, um, as we build that, that is you know, more what people may have associated history with 10 years ago, which is it's all about the information. I mean, people are entertained by that information, but it's very, very much about the in-depth information of topics and subjects and history and science and technology. Well, yeah, it can so, you know, World Wars in the US will be an H2 show. Um, and, and Big History as well, I should talk to as well. So Big History was a big H2 production um, in the US. You know, internationally, um, we will be premiering World Wars on history because I think at this point in time, we're in markets we don't have H2 in play, but that channel will be a channel we will see more launches of in Europe this year and next year. History still remains a place for those big tentpole events that, you know, are historical in nature and spectacular in the way they're delivered. Um, so I would say, yeah, from an international co-production point of view, yes, it is, in terms of the level of per hour that we're investing it is, it is. Thanks, Dean. Um, are, there, are there any ambitions? You, you talk about you know, a, a bouquet of channel, three to six channels. Are there any ambitions to move into to different areas? Because you know, we've seen other, other folks move into sport, for example, or into uh, you know, sport, kids. There are other genres that you don't exploit as a channels group. And I just wonder, maybe medium to long term, whether, whether you're mindful that there are opportunities in, in those in those places? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I, I would say that we generate our growth through our content. I think that's at the forefront of our growth. So I could not see us going out and buying a um, sports network because we're not, you know, at this point in time, a and &E, &E Networks is not a sports content business. Um, FYI is a great example where, as you say, you know, you could look across other genres and look like, do we think there's something we can do differently in that space that's not being done knowing the quality of, you know, our creative and executive team. And we decided actually lifestyle is somewhere where we can bring something different and we'll do that. So, you know, I wouldn't rule out other genres, but it wouldn't be through major sort of an acquisition of another company at this point in time. And you never say never. There might be something out there that comes up tomorrow and we think is, a, is the right sort of bolt on to our business. But I think what we're very focused on is remaining leaders in content origination, um, and we're going to begin that now in lifestyle as well. And and it's still relatively early in the year. It's, if we were sitting here in twelve months' time, how how would uh, how would things look different in terms of the channels launched and such like? I guess that's a long-winded way of saying what are your goals for the next next. Well, year? you would see more A and &E, &E channels in Europe. Um, you would see more H two channels in Europe. I think H two is a really. I mean H two is one of the highest growth channels in the US. Uh, we launched H2 uh, May last year, and you know, that has been, you know, that's transformed 70% growth year on year. So you know, I'm very, very focused on H2, um, as well as A&E as, as a network. Um, I think you'll begin to see more formats being adapted by our channels and market, as we spoke about. So you know, across our history networks and A&E networks in Europe, more local formats. And I'm hopeful you'll see, you know, more big productions. Um, you know, we've had some big successes in markets like Italy of late, uh, Mafia Bunkers, which was, you know, a two-hour special, but the highest rating show in the history of Italian pay TV and factual ever. So we're not going to take an hour off the ball in terms of these standout pieces as well. How many, uh, if I can put you on the spot, how many A&Es might there be by this time next year internationally? <laughs> Between one and ten, I would say. Between uh, one and ten. <laughs> Are there, are there launches that, that you guys are actively working on that we can expect within you yeah, know, weeks, I think, months? Yeah, I think, you know, there'll be hopefully some news coming before the summer. Um, 
on A and E um, on those launches. Okay. And I should say lifetime as well. You know, it's when you've when you've been as successful as we have in our first you know six months in the UK. I mean, that's that is fantastic. We have to take that story and take that success to other markets and demonstrate you know what lifetime can do with an original you know mix of you know scripted original never seen before movies and scripted drama and obviously with any &E networks now backing our scripted play you know lifetime is a channel that you'll see more launches in europe um i can't i wouldn't say you know can commit right now there's where we're launching but i'm very confident there will be some deals and some more launches in emia um in this in this calendar year so it's an you know i would say it's an exciting business to to be in, you know, with great new brands launching. And I think the key thing about all these brands is they're all unique. You don't see a whole bunch of content shifting across history to A&E, to Lifetime, to H2. Like every channel is its own channel, has its own position, has its own unique content. I think that is one of the things that allows us to be successful now. It's this, you know, cliche, but fewer, bigger, better really is what platforms want now. You've got to really back your channels with, you know, a large number of really high quality hours that are on point in terms of what the channel is. So that's why, you know, I'm certainly, you know, I feel very privileged to be in this role and also very confident about, you know, the growth that we saw in 2013 continuing to, you know, happen in 14 and 15 and beyond. Good stuff. Uh, we're out of time. Um, but thank you, Dean. We covered lots of, you know, content channels, uh, different territories and, and such like. So thanks for giving us such a detailed picture of what's going on. Um, so if you can join me thanking Dean Pozniski for joining. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>